everybody. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I hope everybody's staying safe and well out there. This is just a very brief, very casual lecture to talk a little bit about the tools and tooling that I use when working with digital audio and with some of the other tools that are available because I feel like there's a lot out there and it all can be pretty confusing. But now that we have some notion of PCM, samples, sample rate, uh, sample size, etc. then we're in a position where we can actually understand what these tools do. All the audio tools are basically sample generators. So let's go ahead and get started, talk about that. And, you know, let's start with the observation that we are very used to working with visual tools. Almost all the tools we use at a computer involve display on a screen. And so the fact that audio is invisible, that it can't be directly seen with our eyeballs, is a real pain in the neck. We um, can't take in a whole sound at once. We have to hear it temporally over time, which is annoying. When you're looking at something, you can focus your attention on the part of it that is interesting. But of course, at any instant in time, the part of a sound that's interesting is the sound pressure you're hearing right now. A lot of what's going on is hard for us to untangle. I can look at a picture in more detail. I can't really, it's hard to look at a sound in more detail directly as a human being. And unlike images where everything's in the spatial domain, the sounds are really more in the frequency domain, and we'll talk about that next lecture, than they are in the time domain. And so we have this problem of a completely unintuitive representation that isn't like anything we encounter in the physical world. All our stuff is in the spatial domain, except audio is in some weird frequency domain that's hard to work with. And so what I'm gonna do is just walk up the stack a little bit and talk about the various levels and what's going on. Um, I'm gonna talk mostly about the Linux stack because that's what I know. The story really is the same but different at, on Mac OS or on Windows. They all have sound hardware. They all have low level drivers. They all have some kind of libraries sitting over the low level drivers for the hardware that abstract it enough so that you can start to work with it. Uh, on Macintosh, they have a big advantage in that they control their sound hardware. Apple's sound hardware has actually historically been pretty good. They have kept things reasonably simple because they like to build low cost things while still providing pretty good functionality for recording and playing sound. Windows, of course, like Linux, gets whatever the PC gets basically. And for the last 20 years at least, it's been Intel's audio that comes built with their chipsets for motherboard chipsets for desktops and laptops. And those chipsets haven't changed very much on the audio side in the last 20 years. Intel's HD audio is sort of AC97 compatible and the AC97 was the audio codec circa 1997. So the thing you're working with is a system that again was designed to be cheap but isn't super well designed isn't super well maintained they just keep putting it in things and it isn't just intel amd has been forced to be compatible with ac97 and so and very few manufacturers want to put a third-party chipset to handle audio on their motherboard you can absolutely buy for hundreds of dollars or more very, very nice audio cards for your desktop. But of course, nobody's using desktops anymore. And for laptops, the limitations of U USB itself in terms of latency have really made people shy away for a long time from doing USB third-party audio that's sort of intended to be good. It's always intended to be cheap and to be a substitute for those things where there's no audio jacks on your machine. Apple for a while decided to try that too and actually left the audio jacks off their laptops. It was an extremely unpopular decision. I don't remember if they're back or not. 
anyway, it's all kind of stuff under there. So there's once you get above that layer, uh, there's sort of more attempts at common APIs. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about the various pieces. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history, not because you need it, but just because I think it's interesting. It turns out the original Linux audio system, wow, 90s sometime, when Linux was new, was a thing called the Open Sound System, which was done basically by one person and was a not terrible solution. It looked a lot like, at the software layer, what Sun was doing with their workstations. It provided an audio device from which you could read or write samples, and it had drivers for the few cards that were available for, at the time. Open Sound System is still around, um, and what happened with it is that at some point, the author decided that this should be a profit-making venture and did not open source license it going forward. And the other Linux developers said, hey, that's on you, but we won't be including it with Linux anymore because we want Linux to be all open source and because nobody wants to pay you for your audio drivers. And so the developer said, okay. And like I say to this day, you can buy from this website here uh, open sound system for your Unix box. It's not obvious why you would in any way that I can figure out, but there we are. So that's a little story that gets repeated over and over in the open source world. I felt like it was a story worth telling. The other, the replacement for that, after a while, after everybody sort of figured out what to do, was a thing called also the Advanced Linux Sound Architecture, I think. Yes, I got it right. Which is a Mostly drivers with a thin library layer, well, a thicker than it needs to be library layer on top. The idea of the ALSA project is to provide, on the one hand, drivers for modern hardware, and that includes a driver for USB audio and a driver for AC97, Intel HD audio, and some other things. And on top of that is a library layer, which is really heavy on communication of sound between processes. The modern thing, so 40 years ago, sound systems for workstations, there was quite a bit of interest in having shared sound between workstations and certainly shared sound between different applications on the same workstation. But the hardware really wasn't ready for it yet. The computers weren't fast enough. There wasn't enough memory. There weren't enough applications that could work right with it. And so some of the old audio servers were abandoned. And when Lib also came along, it proposed a different approach, which is that if you want to write an application, you write it against the ALSA library, and it tries to communicate with other applications using shared memory as the interface and it's a really really interesting system and it works surprisingly well which is to say not very but while wow, it's surprising it works at all and that became the standard that's what everybody sits on top of now so that for linux is sort of the common layer there's a similar common layer in windows there's a sim similar common layer on the mac so that's that uh and but everybody was eager for a server. And as usual in the Linux world, of course, that means we have not one, but two. The incumbent is an old, old system called Jack. Jack is the Jack Audio Connection Kit. And so it's one of those acronyms, which may tell you something all off the top. And the idea of Jack was for people who really wanted to do commercial-ish grade audio on their Linux box, this provides very low latency, as low latency as they can manage, very low overhead, sample rate control, ways for applications to share sound with each other and with the device drivers with also. And for probably a decade, that was the go-to solution if you were writing some kind of fancy musicians music software that you wanted to run under Linux. 
more recently, but still a long time ago now, uh, Pulse Audio came along, which was an attempt to go back to this old idea of the server-based sound system. So a Pulse Audio process runs on your computer, either per user or per machine, depending on how you've configured Pulse Audio. And that acts as the central point for sharing. Now, for consumer audio, Pulse Audio, it started really buggy and it's still pretty buggy and terrible. But after years and years of iterating on it, we've got it to the point where it kind of works. And for consumer audio applications, Pulse provides pretty much exactly the services you want for processing audio. Let me pull that little control panel I had open the other day and bring it on the screen. So this is the Pulse Audio audio mixer and you can see that it's pretty convenient to use. You can see my microphone uh, modulating the signal. You can see that's working and happening. You can see that there's audio cap screen audio capture also available and you can see that it knows that it's OBS, the thing I'm recording on that's doing this stuff. So I have a range of input devices connected to this, a range of output devices connected to this machine and all of them are configurable in some fairly flexible ways. That's the kind of thing consumers want, high-end consumers want. Low-end consumers never open the control panel. They just hope their audio works, and most of the time it just does now with Pulse. And high-end consumers want to know what's going on, want to fiddle with stuff. I change all the time what my sound, my microphone is. I change all the time what my audio output is. And for me, that's still a good level. Jack, configuring Jack is done using fairly fancy, terrible tools and is quite tricky to get right, partly because they're very concerned about latency in Jack and will sort of punish you for not getting your latencies where they need to be, which means that it takes a lot more fiddling to get it to do anything well at all. And so, and they don't coexist very well. It's been very recently that Pulse Audio and Jack have been on the same page as far as communicating with each other. Now. Are Mac and Windows the same way? Yeah, to some degree they are. Uh, for Windows, there's the Windows Sound API, and then there's a separate low latency API that's sort of third party that musicians and those types use. And the messes there from what little tiny bit I've been exposed to it are worse than on Linux. So that's not an uncommon thing. Now the new hotness, there's a thing called Pipewire, which I've just started looking at. I meant to get it up before this lecture and actually poke at it, but I'm really reluctant to do it on the machine that I'm recording lectures and doing uh, live lectures on. But Pipewire is a thing that just reached 0 0.3. It's the brand new hotness. It's a giant pile of C code, which claims to replace both Pulse Audio and Jack with a single integrated reasonable thing that supports all the APIs initial oh it also claims to tries to replace G streamer that's what it started out to do so it's actually an audio and video all-in-one solution I've heard really good things about Pipewire so far but I've never tried it myself it's probably maybe the future but I just don't know at this point so that gets us up out of the infrastructure we've got we're to the point now where we can actually at least talk about user land and user land applications that are user facing. And I guess part of the reason I wanted to do this lecture is to give you the impression of how much is under the hood of processing of audio. And that's bad in about three ways. It's bad because it's complicated, which means it's gonna break a lot and it's hard to set up and maintain. It's bad because it means that a lot of resources are going to be chewed up, a lot of CPU and a lot of memory processing the audio through all these layers. And it's bad because it means latency, which is almost always our enemy, is going to be high in these systems. Even Jack's latencies aren't spectacular by commercial standards. To some extent, that's because it's running on Linux, an operating system that doesn't do real time all that well. That wasn't what it was built for and it struggles with it. But to some extent, it's because Jack is sort of stuck with the layering and stuff that's above and below it and is part of a big latency chain. 
So, obviously, I can't talk about all the audio tools in just a few minutes, and the budget I've given myself is just a few minutes. So let's just talk, you know, sort of, we sort of can very roughly divide audio tools into three kinds. There are tools that generate audio, there are tools that record audio, right? And there are tools that process audio. And this is sort of, in the audio world, a very common paradigm for thinking about audio. Either you're taking it in, you're putting it out, you're doing something with it or all of the above. And some tools are obviously more or less in the one space. So uh, Fluid Synth, for example, which is a really nice older synthesizer, which uses something called sound fonts for its sound stuff. Uh, it apparently has a GIF that changes as it goes, is a classic synthesizer that supports all different kinds of synthesis modules and that kind of thing. So this is mostly a generation tool and we'll look at generation tools a little later in the course. Uh, there's languages for generating sound and for processing sound and the obvious one is an old old thing called C sound which is unbelievably low level but does let you do some really convenient things. It's sort of designed to get you away from writing audio code in C and write, instead you write audio code in a language that looks more like some kind of high level assembly language, I guess. But you absolutely can use it to do some interesting stuff. So that's another infrastructure layer that's sort of on the generation side. On the record and play side, there's sort of the whole range of things. At one end, Pulse Audio has tools called PA Record and PA Play, which absolutely PA Record is sort of just what you think it is. You, you run a command line command and it records your audio. And when you're ready to stop recording audio, you wait for a specified number of seconds of silence or you hit control C twice and it stops recording. Oh, sorry, that's the socks one. The PA Record, I don't even remember how you stop it. You know, that's as simple as it gets, kind of. Uh, on the other end of the scale is a tool that I've used only very little called Ardor, which is an attempt to bring a commercial grade um, digital audio workstation and, you know, recording management workstation to Linux. Um, but it's cross platform, it runs on several platforms. Uh, Ardor's neat and is sort of feels very old school in terms of the capabilities it provides. I get the feeling that somebody who is more of a professional sound person than me would really appreciate the interface. I happen to have a Behringer 3216 mixer, X32 um, 16 mixer, that is a fantastic piece of equipment and this will actually talk to its interface. It's that kind of level of professional. So we have all the things in the record and play space and it's kind of interesting. And on Windows, you know, there's a ton of commercial tools. On Mac, there's a ton of commercial tools that fill these same functions. I'm focusing partly on the Linux stuff here, although I didn't mention it too, that tools that are free. Uh, most of the tools that are available for free on Linux are available for free on the other platforms and you know, it's not uncommon to pay thousands of dollars at least for commercial grade audio solutions. On the processing size side, there's way too many different plugin standards for building little modular audio processing bits and way too many implementations of those standards. The sort of venerable one on Linux, the one that I will give the most attention to in this course is a thing called LADSPA, the Linux Audio Developers Simple Plugin API, because everybody likes really weird acronyms. Uh, LADSPA basically defines a C interface to a shared library that you build uh, so that some kind of host container can write samples into your thing, read samples out of your thing, work provide a user interface for you and tell you how the controls are being set. And 
There's a Ladspa version 2 out, which has got less acceptance. On the Windows side, there's VST, and I believe on the Mac side as well, there's VST, which is a commercial Schlumberger or Schlumberger, I don't even know how you say their name, standard for plugins. So there's a lot of stuff out there. We'll poke at some of it during this course. I'd encourage you to go out in the areas of audio that you're interested in sort of pause right now or right after this lecture and look around, see what tools are available if you haven't before. And we can start a discussion on the Slack about which ones are what and are interesting. And that'd be helpful to me in updating these notes. So what I wanna do in this course to start with is sort of start with a couple of very simple tools that I'll be using throughout the course because they're very simple and they're free and open source. They're cross-platform, at least to some degree, and they are very capable of doing the basic stuff that we'll care about. One of those is a thing called SOX. SOX is sort of literally, I say literally, and then put it in double quotes, <laughs> that's terrible, the Swiss Army knife of sound programs. There's very little that you would want to do with a command line sound tool is, I guess it's literally according to its, that's how they describe themselves. And sound exchange, which is what SOX stands for, is a command line tool with an insanely complicated command line interface. Uh, if I say SOX help, you'll see that it sort of goes on for pages and pages and this isn't this is just the surface level but what you also see is that it supports a lot of things there's looks like about 30 effects in that they can apply to audio or that they can use to generate audio in socks there's billions of audio file formats here another probably 40 audio or 50 audio formats that will support and it'll do other stuff too if you dig down into its command line arguments. So if I want to play a sine wave on the standard output, for example, let's see if I can get it in one try. It's always hard. So I can say socks minus N, meaning for your input file, don't just use dev null, don't do anything. Minus D, meaning for the output file, use the standard audio device on your machine. And the, either of these can be file names, they can be standard in, they can be standard out, they can be a lot of things, but I want these. And synth and the duration of the synthesized sound, let's do two seconds. Um, and the effect I want, which is a sine wave and a frequency that I want the sine wave to be at, which will put it at 440 Hertz. And I uh, also, I think, want to apply gain of minus 20 um, de decibels to get it quiet enough we can actually hear it. Let's see if I missed anything. Nope, there's your sine wave. So that's cool. And so if you want to hear the difference between a sine wave and a square wave and whatever, oh, of course it has all those. So this is what a square wave sounds like it's a little louder i should probably turn it down another bit uh notice that the gains are given in db this is an audio program that's the unit audio people use let's let's listen to a triangle and that starts to sound like some sounds you've heard in video games and that kind of stuff if you want to one that sounds like an electric organ sound this is the classic reed sound from an electric organ this is a sawtooth wave and so great it's a sine wave generator but of course it does a million other things too i can use it to read and write wave files i can use it to compress i can use it to do sort of a million different things and so if, you know, if you're interested in command line stuff i would really encourage you in taking a look at socks if you're interested in something more gooey then we have Audacity, which is quite cr cross-platform. Audacity is a tool for uh, visualizing what's going on with your sound and editing it visually. It's sort of a cross, oops, open on the wrong screen. 
It also is very open sourcey. Excuse the giant pile of weird messages. Um, it provides an interface for recording, playing, and editing sound, which is somewhere between something like Ardor that we looked at earlier. It's a much simpler interface, which means it's a little bit less capable, but also means that it's quite a lot easier to drive. So let's actually create a new thing here. Uh, looks like we got the project sample rate set to 44 kilohertz. Let's set it to 48 kilohertz. And let's, uh, let's record some voice, if I can remember how we do that. It looks like this recording button probably the this will probably do it so let's record new track this is a test of recording with audacity and you'll notice that it's coming there just fine uh, the gain isn't everything you'd like that's all going to be adjustable later audacity likes to leave a lot of headroom you'll notice that it's running at about half amplitude here and when i'm tired of recording i can push the stop button the stop button and there I am I've recorded audio now notice that thanks to the magic of pulse audio lying way way under us it was able to record that at the same time that I was recording this video so that's actually a big improvement about how things were in the old Linux days and really in the old Windows and Mac days when exactly one program could be accessing the microphone at a time uh, this kind of sharing is really really useful so let's see if we can play back what we just recorded yeah, sounds really pretty good. It didn't, didn't sound bad at all. I'm not going to listen to the whole thing. And now, of course, now that you have it, you can start to do things with it, right? So let me make this bigger so you can actually see it. I'm just now realizing it's hard to see. Uh, I'm going to scroll it a little wider, too, so that it starts to look more like a sound thing. And then I'm going to, and the controls here are, well, unintuitive would be a compliment. Uh, you'll have to figure them out. I'm not going to give a full Audacity tutorial here, but I want to get rid of the lead into this so that it starts sooner. I'm going to go to the other end, which is down here somewhere, and get rid of the trailer here so that it ends sooner. Um, and in between, I really would like to do what's called compression, which we'll talk about later. In fact, I'll probably have you build a compressor at some point because it's fun, which is, which is, I don't know how this thing works. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, which is a technique for, you know, you'll notice that the amplitude of this signal is sort of not that high for most of it. And, you know, you want to leave some headroom because you don't want to blow people out and because you you want to there we go and you because you want to leave some room for processing and effects and stuff but what we're going to do here is what's called compression which tries to adjust the volume dynamically so that the signal of the the the, the sound is more uniform in volume across the whole sample so let's see how that works you'll notice it's very loud at the beginning when i was shouting and kind of loud at the end where i was doing more shouting but over here it kind of trailed off we don't like that very much so let's turn on a compressor and let's set the compression ratio which sort of controls how pronounced the effect is a whole bunch up let's set the threshold down way a bunch um, we'll leave the attack time and release time short you'll notice the attack time is two tenths of a second and the release time is a second so what is the attack and release time it says well how long do I you know how long do I spend adjusting the volume down when it gets louder how much time do I spend adjusting the volume up as it gets softer? I've got compress based on peaks checked, meaning uh, that you know if I turn this off, it'll measure the RMS amplitude of the sound. If I turn it on, it'll measure the peak amplitude, peak to peak amplitude, and that's something we talked about earlier in the course as well. And you'll notice make up gain for zero decibels after compressing. So we've got the gain all adjusted such that it shouldn't change the overall level very much at the end it just is going to make up the peak gain be zero db so let's see what this looks like when we compress it yeah and it has compressed it for zero db which is you know probably more than you want so it's going to be quite a bit louder 
Let me turn the volume down somewhere. Why don't we turn it down right here real fast? And we'll see what this sounds like. Oops. Yeah. We'll see what this sounds like when we play it. This is a test of recording with Audacity. And you'll notice that it's coming. Oh, sorry. It's probably not playing uh, at all. Uh, uh, let's try that again. Like sorry, I'm just trying to get, get it so you folks aren't blown out. Let me try one more time. This is a this test, is a test of, of recording, recording with Audacity. With Audacity. You'll, notice you'll notice that it's coming there just, just fine. fine. Uh, uh, the gain, the gain isn't, isn't everything like, like. That's, that's all going to be adjusted later. later. Audacity, Audacity likes, likes to leave a lot of headroom. Head 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 you'll notice that it's running right about half amplitude here. 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 And, when and when I'm tired of it, so what you'll notice is that. Yeah, so what you'll notice is that not only was it amplified quite a bit by the compressor but the the sound is a lot more uniform in volume across the whole sample if if you listen to commercial stuff it's often very heavily compressed this is one of the things that makes your sound sound professional but the real point here isn't so much to talk about effects that's coming up in a little bit it's to talk about this tool which has you know nice indication of you know nice waveform stuff i can sort of um go all the way to where I can see an actual waveform here and I can make it bigger so that it's easier to see. So this is what my voice sounds like at some point in time. I can, you know, if I go to a smaller scale, I can sort of get a sense of the peaks and troughs of the actual voice itself. And, uh, and I can, like I showed you before, do editing. I have control over the project sample rate and it will resample for you if you ask it to. I have control. I can build more than one track and glue them together. If I want to sing over the background of this, which I promise you I won't do to you, uh, I absolutely could in a separate track and we could mix those tracks. So for the kinds of stuff you're going to do, this is really, really nice. Let's look in particular at plot spectrum, which is one of my favorite features. This is over the whole course of the whole thing, what amplitudes are we seeing? You'll notice that everything rolls off pretty sharply, uh, somewhere around 15 kilohertz. There's a nice linear region here. Remember, this is a log, log plot. Is it? No, it's a li log linear plot. And so the, the, the frequency range here is linear, and the amplitude range is in decibels, which is a log scale, because that's what corresponds to human hearing. And so what you're seeing is that there's a lot of fairly low frequencies showing up, and that's because the window's set wrong. And we'll talk next time about, about that. But if I set the window to something sensible, I like Blackman windows. Um, now you see there's a lot more even distribution. This is across the whole program. What we'd really probably like to do is well sorry this is yeah so let's close this pick out some particular section of voice do analyze again plot spectrum and now you see something a little bit more coherent in terms of what's actually going on and notice that it even tries to figure out what note you're at um you know you can actually try to figure out this was mostly around uh 29 hertz which makes sense <laughs> And by you know changing the range, I can get some other things to go on. So that's what I use a lot and what my friends use a lot for messing around with audio. It's a really nice tool for that. And that, folks, is I think most of what I had to tell you today. The We'll talk in the next lecture about frequency domain stuff and about what digital signal processing in the frequency domain looks like, because it's sort of an essential step before we go on. And then we'll come back to these tools and libraries and things with a better understanding of how they work. I hope this was helpful, and I hope you're all staying safe and well. I will talk to you again soon.